All of you have come to hear our distinguished speaker. Uh, the Arizona Humanities Council has got together and has a speaker bureau. And we got acquainted with Richard Lynch on this, and he's done a lot of research. And, and what he does is he's a historical consultant in which he um, goes in and does a lot of research in different areas and help uh, find a lot of information. And I think you'll be intrigued with the slideshow that he has. Uh, he got his BS degree from Stanford and his uh, master's from Arizona State. So um, we're going to turn the time over to Richard and get started. We would like you to just tell uh, something about what you've done on your research, if you could, Richard. You bet. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lewis, for introducing me and for having me come up this evening. And thank you all for coming out tonight on this kind of inclement weather for for a flatlander like me from the valley, this is a, this is a kind of a, a, a stormy night for you all. It's probably just another a spring evening. Uh, this project uh, got started about 1993. Uh, it was the genesis of it originated with the Four Corners Heritage Council, which is a group made up of the uh, governors of the four states of the Four Corners: Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. And they have tried to want to develop heritage tourism in the Four Corners area uh, for the people of the Four Corners and for the people of the United States to come and, and get to know this part of the country. Um, the, one of the members of the Four Corners Heritage Council is Roxanne Knight, who runs Reed's Motor Lodge down in uh, Springerville. And Roxanne hit on the idea of having a trail that kind of comes off the Four Corners. We're really pretty far south of the Four Corners but a loop that comes out and, and attaches itself to the Four Corners, starting at St. John's, coming down the little Colorado to Springerville and Eager, then over past uh, Greer and up on the mountain, uh, down to Fort Apache, back up to Pine Top, Lakeside, Sholo, over to Silver Creek, Shumway, Taylor, Snowflake, Holbrook and Winslow, and then uh, pass off the trail to the Navajos at Winslow. All kinds of trails are being developed all over the Southwest in the Four Corners, uh, in New Mexico and Colorado. And we decided to, to develop this trail uh, through the White Mountains Little Colorado country and started get started my funding part of it in 1995. Uh, and I started doing research uh, in repositories all over the state of Arizona, uh, talking to some of you good folks, uh, doing interviews, uh, talking to people all over the, the mountains in the Little Colorado country, uh, gathering stories, uh, history, folk tales, anything that dealt with the uh, the history of the region. Uh, the first product of this, uh, now going on three years of research, will be a two-hour audio cassette tape that will be a driving tour of the, of the White Mountains in Little Colorado. You'll purchase the tapes, or if you really have a brand new car and have a CD player in it, we're going to have some CDs produced as well. So you can buy CDs or uh, tapes, and you plug it in to your uh, Radio, uh, your radio of your car, and it'll tell you about the history and the culture of the region that you're driving through. Uh, that will be available sometime late this summer, uh, and hopefully we'll get it uh, advertised on a national basis uh, in magazines like Sunset, Historic Traveler, and that sort of thing. So we'll get people coming from all of the United States. Uh, heritage tourism has now become the number two uh, reason for touring the United States uh, after golf, golfing. Uh, Heritage tourism is a very uh, popular way uh, for people to see the United States, and we're hoping to, to bring them into this beautiful country of ours and show them what its, all, what its history is all about. Um, in the process of doing research at NAU and U of A and ASU and talking to you all, I've been able to gather historic photographs and take some current photographs of sites and developed a program about the three cultures that really built this area. It's called a gathering of three cultures. And those cultures are the Anglo culture, made up of all different kinds of people, Texans, uh, Texas cattlemen, uh, Mormon colonists from Utah, uh, uh, bankers from New York, uh, black troopers at Fort Apache, uh, lumbermen at McNary, uh, and then the, the uh, Spanish culture is the second culture we talk about that came over from New Mexico and helped uh, found this region, and the third culture, of course, of the native peoples. And so without further ado, we'll turn off the lights and and give you a gathering of three cultures, a history of the White Mountains, and little Colorado country.
This is the man that started it all, uh, started the European settlement of the White Mountains, little Colorado country. His name is Eshkel Dasala. He was one of the most powerful band chiefs of the Eastern White Mountain Apaches. And in 1864, uh, right after Camp Goodwin was, was founded on the Gila River uh, to engage in, in a, a military expedition against the Apaches, Eshkel Dasala took his White Mountain people down to Camp Goodwin and said, look, I don't want trouble with the United States Army. I don't want trouble with the United States government. Uh, I want to be at peace with you all, and I invite you to come into my country. And if you want to build another base like Camp Goodwin, uh, you can build a base, uh, a military fort, uh, at the confluence of the north and east forks of, of uh, White River. And of course, it took about five years for the United States government to take him up on the offer. But in 1869 and 1870, the United States government founded Fort Apache uh, on the mesa above the confluence of the north and east forks of White River. Uh, Fort Apache did several things to help uh, stimulate settlement of the White Mountains in Little Colorado Country. It, number one, provided a, a perceived umbrella of protection for settlers to come into the area. They no longer were afraid uh, of White uh, Mountain Apache or uh, Mescalero or uh, Chiricahua Apache attack in this part of the country. Uh, number two, it provided a huge market for uh, farmers and cattlemen to, to sell their produce. Uh, and number three, it provided cash income for men from anybody that would settle in the area to, to freight to Fort Apache, uh, to bring in cattle to Fort Apache, to bring in, in uh, all kinds of crops to Fort Apache. So Fort Apache is really the genesis of the, the development of this area. And it gets started with the first troops arriving in May of 1870. Uh, another one of the Apache chiefs who was instrumental in helping get this area settled was a fellow named Miguel, One-Eyed Miguel. And Miguel was a, a band chief of the Carrizo Band of the Cibecue Apaches, lived over on Carrizo Creek. And Miguel really tried to befriend everyone that he came in contact with. He was a most hospitable man. He wanted to be at peace with everyone. And on a trip to uh, Fort Defiance up near to present-day Window Rock in 1869, he bumped into a fellow named Cordon Cooley. And Cordon Cooley was over at Fort Defiance, about to come into this country in search of the Doc Thorne gold mine. Uh, the Doc Thorne mine was a, a legendary gold mine. And Cooley was going to come over and look in this country for it with a fellow, fellow named Banta and another fellow named Dodd. And uh, they came in uh, with Miguel as the guide. And Miguel brought them through the White Mountains, took them down to Salt River. They went down the Salt River looking for the Doc Thorne gold mine. And at about the Tonto Apache country, Miguel stopped and went back to his homeland. And Cooley continued down on the river looking for gold. He didn't find it, didn't find the mythical mine, and came back to enlist as a uh, scout at the newly established Fort Apache. This is the um, uh, Holbrook Courthouse, the Navajo County Courthouse. And this slide is way out of place, so we'll just keep on going. Uh, this, this fellow is Miguel. This is, excuse me, this is um, Pedro. After Cooley had been at Fort Apache for about six months or so, he uh, fell in love with two of Pedro's daughters, Molly and Cora. Pedro is another chief of the one of the Carrizo bands of the CBQ Apaches. He and Miguel had a falling out in the 1850s, and old uh, Pedro had moved up into the White Mountain country. He had asked permission of Eshkel Dasala to come into White Mountain country. Uh, it was granted. He came and brought his people to the North Fork of the White River. And while Cooley was at uh, Fort Apache as a scout, he came up to visit Pedro's people, and he fell in love with Molly, and as was the custom in those days, when he, you married a, a, a White Mountain Apache a woman, you uh, also, if she had a, a, a young sister of marriageable age, you married her as well. So uh, uh, Cordon Cooley married both Molly and Cora. Um, their, um, their pedigree was fairly impressive from in the Apache world. Uh, Pedro had married one of the daughters of Mangus Coloradus, the famous Warm Spring Apache chief. And so uh, Molly's grandfather was now a Mangus Coloradus. 
uh, and her brother uh, was Alchese, who became one of the most important scouts and chiefs of the White Mountain Apache. So uh, Cordon Cooley married royalty when he married uh, Molly and Cora, and that uh, served him well in the years to come. Uh, one of the first people to take advantage of this new fort to bring in uh, uh, crops was a fellow named William Riley Milligan. And Milligan came from Fort Craig, uh, south of Socorro, New Mexico, uh, with, with a large, uh, got a large contract for corn uh, to be sold at Fort Apache, came across into, into Arizona, and came into Round Valley on his way to Fort Apache. He thought, this is really good land for growing crops. Why bring crops all the way from New Mexico or ship them in all the way from, uh, from Kansas? Uh, I'll grow crops right here in, in Round Valley. So after he delivered corn, uh, to, to Fort Apache, he came back and uh, staked a claim on some of the water of the Little Colorado River and uh, eventually uh, took out uh, uh, patents and claims on a thousand acres of land in Round Valley. And in about 1876, he built the first grist mill in the area and uh, started, uh, so he, he did not have to send his, his crops back to Albuquerque to be, to be ground into uh, flour. Uh, they could be ground right here on the Little Colorado, with water from the Little Colorado River. So Milligan is the fellow who, coming over from New Mexico, uh, gets settlement started down in Round Valley. Uh, some of the first uh, scouts to enlist uh, at Fort Apache, uh, Apache scouts in the wars against uh, uh, some of the uh, Chiricahua Apaches and the Tano Apaches were members of Pedro and Miguel's bands, and they became the famous scouts out of Fort Apache. Uh, Fort Apache was a huge establishment and needed lots of uh, grain uh, and uh, hay and all kinds of material, and people began coming into the mountains in large numbers. Uh, in about 1873, there was a large group of uh, Spanish-speaking sheep men over on the Little Colorado River. Uh, they had uh, found this very shallow and narrow crossing of the Little Colorado. Call it, they called it El Vadito, the Little Crossing. Uh, this was much better to cross the sheep here than in the, in the big, wide, quick, sandy-bottomed uh, Little Colorado and other places. So they quickly uh, established a, a camp here and uh, began raising sheep on the Little Colorado. And in 1873, Saul Barth came along from his uh, settlement about 12 miles downstream and had a poker game with these fellows, played some cards, and he won their squatters' rights to 1,200 acres of land and quickly established a large colony of, of Spanish-speaking people from New Mexico mostly from the Wingate Valley from Cubero uh, at El Vadito. And they said, well, Don, uh, Don Solomon, let's call this new town Solomonville for you. He said, no, no, no. Uh, let's name it for the first female resident of the community. Her name was Doña Maria San Juan Baca de Padilla. And therefore, the new colony became San Juan. Uh, and in very short order, uh, it took on the look of a typical New Mexican uh, Spanish-speaking uh, adobe community. Another fellow coming down to take advantage of the new uh, Fort Apache post was a fellow named James Stinson. Uh, Stinson came down from Colorado, was to meet a herd of cattle on the Little Colorado River that he was going to distribute to uh, places like Fort Apache and Fort Whipple. Uh, as he came down from Colorado and, and crossed the uh, Little Colorado at about where Winslow is, about Sunset Crossing, uh, he came up, and instead of going up the Little Colorado, he came up Silver Creek instead. Uh, he really liked the Silver Creek Valley, and, and after he went down and found the, the, his cattle herd on the Little Colorado and had it sold, he came back and settled on the Little Colorado, ex excuse me, he came back and settled on Silver Creek and uh, began the settlement of the Silver Creek Valley. Uh, at about the same time that Stinson's over on Silver Creek, a fellow named Marion Clark is coming into uh, the Sholo Creek Valley. Uh, Clark uh, had been uh, with Milligan over on, in Round Valley in 1871. Uh, he had grown a, tried to grow a crop there in 1872. They had a very late uh, spring and a very dry summer. His crops failed. He went over to work for Cooley over at Fort Apache, and uh, Cooley sent him up to this country, uh, to the Sholo country in 1873 to begin farming up here. And the only reason that, that uh, Clark could come up here to a country where he, which he found in the winter of eight, 1873, no one here, is because these were the, were the hunting grounds of, of Pedro. And Pedro, being uh, in charge lord of this land, uh, allowed Cooley to come up and begin farming up here. And Cooley sent Clark, 
who was here in the winter of 1873 and began farming here using a beaver dam as his irrigation a reservoir dam and bringing out a, a, a small ditch uh, from the, above that beaver dam. And in 1874, he put in 60 acres of barley. In 1875, he put in 120 acres of barley. And in 1876, Cordon Cooley came up to take over the ranch. Uh, this is Cooley at his home down near Honda uh, later on. Uh, but Cooley arrived here in 1876, and Clark moved on uh, to about five miles south of, of what would become Sholo. Uh, <clears throat> Cooley had a large family. He had uh, three boys and three girls. These were Cooley's daughters. Uh, Lily on the left, uh, later on married Delbert Penrod, who was the uh, grandson of William Lewis Penrod, who came to the Sholo country in 1878. Uh, Belle, the middle daughter, was the oldest. Uh, Bell Cooley later married uh, Abe Amos, Abraham Lincoln Amos, who was one of the uh, large sheep men up on the lakeside country. Uh, and then uh, the woman on the right, the little girl on the right, is Cora, who was Cooley's third daughter. Uh, Cora later on married Charles Pettis, who became a large ca cattle rancher, and using his wife's enrollment in the, in the White Mountain Apache tribe, uh, had a large cattle operation down near Roberts Ranch on the White Mountain Apache Reservation. Uh, this fellow, this young man and his family, this is Sanford Jaquis, who was a builder over in St. John's. And uh, in, a, in the early, uh, late 70s, early 80s, he came over to build a large house for Cooley uh, here in the Sholo country. Uh, Cooley had built a large lumber mill here on Sholo Creek. And uh, he used that lumber. Uh, and Mr. Jaquis came over and built uh, what was known as the White House. Uh, it was a large two-story frame house up on the hill. and. Uh, it was not white, of course, but uh, it was such an imposing structure for the White Mountains and the little Colorado country that they called it the White House. This was Cooley's home that later on, of course, became the first bishop's home uh, when the Sholo country was sold to the Mormons in 1903. Uh, at about the time that Cooley's coming up from Fort Apache to the Sholo country, a young man named Henry Springer uh, was starting a store over in what was going to be called Springerville in honor of him. Uh, this is, of course, a much younger picture of, of Henry when he was a, little, was a young man. We haven't found any later pictures, so I thought, well, we'll use this one as when he was a little boy in New Mexico. Uh, but in 1876, he started a large um, mercantile store in Round Valley, and uh, he made the mistake of, of selling uh, some of his seed and uh, supplies on credit to a rather unsavory element that was then residing, hiding out in Round Valley. Uh, when he didn't get paid back, his company went out of business, and Henry left uh, Round Valley rather unceremoniously uh, with his tail between his legs. Uh, but in honor or in jest, uh, they named the new town Springerville uh, for the departed Henry Springer. Uh, at about this same time, 1876, uh, the Mormon colonists come down from Utah, uh, sent by Brigham Young and uh, 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 guided by Jacob Hamlin. And they come into the upper, up, the upper reaches of the, it's rather the lower reaches of the Little Colorado River and form four colonies, uh, uh, St. Joseph, which became Joseph City that we see here, uh, Obed across the Little Colorado River, uh, which built a rather large fort in anticipation of Indian attack uh, and later was abandoned because it was a rather low, swampy place, uh, not too far from the Choya, Opera, the Choya Power Plant today. And then the other two places, of course, were Brigham City, uh, not far from what would become Winslow and Sunset Crossing on the south side of the Little Colorado River, uh, uh, which was a famous crossing of the river. Uh, those four were the first, or the four original colonies of Mormon colonists here in the Little Colorado. And they had a devil of a time uh, because of the capriciousness of the Little Colorado River of uh, getting any dams to stick and getting any crops in. Over in Round Valley, by 1880, things were pretty hot and heavy. Uh, Round Valley was, a, Springerville was about 350 miles from the county seat of Prescott. Uh, this was all part of Yavapai County in those days. And by 1880, the uh, outlaw element of New Mexico and Colorado and Mexico and Utah and had figured out that Round Valley was a pretty good place to hide out. Uh, a lot of uh, very bad men uh, decided to take up residence all the way along the Little Colorado from uh, Round Valley all the way up to St. John's. Uh, they had some pretty hot times. Uh, uh, eventually, folks like the, the Clantons were there, uh, the Blanton gang, 
the, the Westbrooks, which were the remnants of the Butch Cassidy and the, and the Hole in the Wall gang. A lot of bad guys were making their uh, temporary home in Round Valley in 1880, and it was a pretty wild place to live in those days. Uh, up on Silver Creek, things were a little bit different. Uh, in 1878, uh, William Jordan Flake, who had had enough of living on the Little Colorado and having the dams wash out, went in search of a better place to farm and he bought out Stinson's holding for a huge sum of money, around $13,000 in, in good Mormon cattle. And he took uh, Stinson's adobe buildings and added on to them and began, began the settlement, which became, of course, known as Snowflake, uh, for William Jordan Flake that you see here, who is known as the builder of towns on the little Colorado country, and Erastus Snow, who was one of the apostles of the Mormon church. Uh, Erastus Snow gave snow to the town, and William Jordan Flake gave flake. Therefore, Snowflake. About that same time that uh, William Jordan Flake is getting started on, on, on Silver Creek, uh, Don Lorenzo Hubble uh, went into St. John's to see about setting up a store and expanding his mercantile empire. Hubble was the product of a uh, Connecticut Yankee father and a Spanish mother from a large uh, Spanish family in New Mexico. Uh, he, after he had started his uh, large uh, operation at Ganado on the Navajo Reservation. He came into St. John's looking for mercantile operations and probably a wife, because very soon he married uh, uh, a woman named Ruby, uh, who was uh, supposedly one of the best looking Spanish women in the uh, uh, entire little Colorado country. Uh, she became Don Lorenzo's wife. Uh, Hubble was appalled at what was happening in St. John's. Uh, the merchants were being thrown out of their stores at will by outlaws who came in and took over. Uh, the outlaws were both Spanish-speaking and Anglo and English-speaking. Uh, it didn't matter. There were a lot of them. Uh, Hubble decided that enough was enough, and he went and bought guns and armed all the merchants and the Spanish-speaking people of St. John's. And a, a pretty good-sized war broke out between uh, the outlaw element and the, uh, some of the new cattlemen coming into the country. And it would, uh, by Hubble's estimate, about 295 men were killed along the Little Colorado uh, during the time of the, of the wars from about 1878 to 1884. At about this time, the things are hot and heavy over and in, the, in Round Valley and in the, in the little Colorado up to St. John's. And uh, when uh, uh, our friend uh, Mr. Flake is getting started over in um, Snowflake, uh, cat, uh, sheep first came into the White Mountain area. Uh, this, these are sheep on the mountains. Came in in about 1879, uh, the, mostly from sheep men from Oregon. Uh, one, of the, one of the sheep men that uh, you may know of is a fellow named Robert Scott. He was one of the three Scott brothers who came into the country in 1879. The interesting thing about uh, Scott, and we'll backtrack just a little bit to show you um, how things or interesting things happen uh, with settlement patterns in this country, how they all sort of tie together. Uh, at an earlier day, uh, in about the early 1870s, a fellow named Felix Scott, who was Robert's uncle, uh, came into the country and settled at the confluence of the Little Colorado and Silver Creek. And pretty soon, uh, Mormon colonists got tired of battling the Little Colorado and moved up and bought him out and formed the Mormon community of Woodruff, uh, of course, named after the president of the, of the Mormon church, Wilford Woodruff. Uh, so our friend uh, Felix Scott moved on to the Silver Creek Valley. And pretty soon along came James Pierce and John Standiford and bought him out and started Taylor, Arizona. So by this time, it's 1878, Felix Scott came up and found Marion Clark over here in the Sholo Valley and bought him out, bought out Marion Clark and started the Scott Ranch. And of course, that's out where Scott Reservoir is and the, the Jaquist Ranch uh, because uh, uh, St. Jaquist uh, was uh, the stepson of Robert Scott eventually. And uh, that's how the, the Scott Ranch became the Jaquist Ranch. But Robert Scott was one of the major cattlemen, uh, well, excuse me, one of the major sheepmen in the area. and. Uh, uh, had come in with his three brothers, uh, uh, two brothers, James and George. Uh, James, of course, was the, an early sheriff of Apache County and later treasurer of Navajo County. And uh, George Scott uh, uh, lived here between here and Los Angeles for many, many years uh, and had spent his last years over in Pinedale. But sheep, the sheep raising business up in the White Mountain country and these foothills around Sholo and what would become Lakeside was a, was a very big business up here. Um, uh, down, in, down in Round Valley, uh, this is the Becker's store. Uh, after uh, Mr. Springer left, uh, the Becker brothers uh, 
were the major tenants, uh, the major uh, uh, general merchants. I uh, had the largest general merchandise store in, in Springerville. And uh, in about 1885, they moved their operation from the Little Colorado River into the present site of Springerville. And the town really, really started going in the early 1880s. Uh, at about this time, in the early 80s, the 24 uh, cattle company over on the Little Colorado between Springerville and St. John's had about 15,000 head of cattle spread out over the range. This is the headquarters of the 24 company. It was an English company run by three Englishmen, Mr. Uh, Mr. T, Mr. Uh, Carson, and Mr. Smith. Uh, Smith, Carson, and T ran the 24 cattle company. Uh, but cattle were really starting to come into the country now in the early 1880s. Another uh, cattleman that came in from Texas uh, was a fellow named Micah J. Harris Phelps. Uh, along with America's Vespucius Greer, uh, they joined the church, the Mormon church in Texas, and uh, started trading their herds to uh, Arizona. Uh, while his boys uh, uh, started trading the cattle from Texas to the Brazos country of Texas into the Round Valley area, uh, Phelps went to Salt Lake City and joined the church and then took out a homestead right on the Little Colorado River, a 100-acre homestead, and, and started the, the famous uh, Phelps Ranch uh, in Round Valley. Uh, the railroad is starting to come into the country this time, the early 1880s. Uh, it's gonna add a whole new dimension to the, to the growth of the, of the area. Uh, this is a building, the Atlantic and Pacific, which became the Santa Fe into Arizona in about 1881. Um, and a, one of the large uh, engines, the big, uh, uh, smokestack, the pot-bellied smokestack of the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad at that time uh, reached a place that was called Holbrook in 1881. It was named for Henry Randolph Holbrook, who was a, an engineer with the, the Santa Fe Railroad and had built many uh, track, a lot of track in Colorado. He came into Arizona and uh, John W. Young, who was Brigham Young's son, wanted to curry favor with uh, Holbrook to, to get a, a, a town site set up right where uh, Young wanted to put the Arizona Commercial, or Arizona Cooperative Mercantile Institution, and he um, was successful. They called it Holbrook, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Holbrook got crosswise with John Young and moved the Holbrook town site about a mile and a half to the west. So the ACMI, ACMI was stuck with no place to have its goods, and so they moved their major operation down to Woodruff. And Woodruff became the headquarters of the ACMI. The large two-story building that you see there to the right of Woodruff Butte uh, was the, uh, the headquarters of the ACMI in Arizona uh, before it moved to Holbrook in, the, in 1888. Uh, when it did move, uh, this became a social hall and dance uh, hall and a meeting room, a meeting for the Mormon community of, uh, of Woodruff. Uh, with uh, the ACMI not in Holbrook, the, the major merchants became the Schusters. Adolph and ben Benjamin Schuster started a a small general merchandise store, uh, and most of the merchants in the White Mountains usually, uh, when they had small mercantile operations, they would buy wholesale from the Schuster brothers, and the Schuster operation uh, lasted in the White Mountain and little Colorado country well into the 20th century, into the 1950s. Uh, the Holbrook, went, the railroad then went on from Holbrook to Winslow, uh, and uh, got Winslow started in 1882. Uh, Winslow was named for uh, a uh, a president of the St. Louis and San Francisco Railroad, which was one of the co-owners of the, of the Atlantic and Pacific, and uh, his name was Winslow, and they named the town Winslow and became a major division point uh, on the Santa Fe Railroad, and of course it's one of the, it's the westernmost town on our regional uh, tour. In 1882, uh, St. John's made the county seat of Apache County. Uh, they built a new courthouse and jail. Uh, things were pretty rough in 1882, uh, and they came to a head at the uh, uh, Fiesta Bullfight, uh, in which the Greers rode into town expecting to uh, see some cattle that they were going to buy. It was a trap laid by the uh, Spanish-speaking residents of St. John's, and uh, things got a little hot and heavy. Uh, they, the Greers were surrounded. Luckily, most of these uh, Spanish-speaking folks were not great riflemen, were not great marksmen, and they... Um, uh, they did not uh, uh, have much luck in killing the Greers. Some of them escaped. Uh, the Greers were holed up in, a, in, a, um, in an unfinished adobe home, and uh, hundreds of shots were exchanged. 
the only uh, fatalities, unfortunately, was, was uh, Nathan Tenney, who was, uh, tried to make peace between the two sides and was shot for the, his trouble, and a fellow named Jimmy Vaughn, who was uh, actually an adopted son of, of Micah J. Harris Phelps. Uh, he was a Texas cowboy. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of bad feeling was going on between the folks and that a lot of the worst human emotions were uh, running wild in St. John's in 1882 uh, between newcomers and old timers, between sheepmen and cattlemen, uh, between Mormon Texans and Catholic uh, Spanish-speaking New Mexicans. Uh, it was a very bad time for, for the folks up there uh, and luckily it didn't last a whole lot longer. Uh, the, the human nature was, the, the best of human nature was not uh, in evidence in St. John's in 1882. Uh, early 1880s, the Shumway Grist Mill uh, came into being at a new little community called Shumway up, up at the head of uh, Silver Creek. There was a pretty good fall of water there, and the Grist Mill uh, was put in in about 1881, and people from as far away as Sholo and uh, the upper country came down and had their, their flower ground at the, at the Shumway Grist Mill. Uh, by 1883, uh, the pioneer period in Snowflake was beginning to end, and uh, the, the community had become fairly prosperous and the uh, log cabins and uh, plank shacks of the early days were beginning to make way for brick buildings, uh, locally fired brick. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Snowflake Ward Chapel that was built in 1883 and 1884. Um, the ACMI went into Snowflake, a branch of the ACMI went into Snowflake in 1884, um, a rather substantial building for, the, for a pioneer period, and uh, then some of the beautiful brick homes of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Snowflake Valley. Uh, this is Charles Flake's home. Uh, Charles had a very untimely death uh, when he went to arrest a, a, a very bad man. He and his brother James Madison uh, went to arrest a thief and uh, Charles was killed for his troubles. Uh, James Madison shot the outlaw and was awarded $25,000, which he promptly gave to the church and to the widows and orphans of Snowflake. This is Charles Flake's home that is now the home of uh, Flake Willis, who was his grandson. In 1885, the famous or infamous hash knife outfit, depending on your point of view, uh, came into the country from Texas. The Aztec Land and Cattle Company uh, brought in 30,000 Longhorns, trailed them in, and brought them in by uh, train, newfangled train cars. Uh, some of the first shipping by rail went on with bringing Aztec cattle into the country. They were turned loose from Holbrook all the way to Winslow. Uh, south of the railroad track to the Mogollon Rim. Uh, the Aztec had bought a million acres of land from the railroad. Uh, the railroad needed to make a payment on their debt, and they sold the million acres to the Aztec for 50 cents an acre, or $500,000. Uh, they were, was done in odd uh, numbered sections, so in effect, uh, the Aztec controlled two million acres and was to be a source of great uh, prosperity for the country and a source of great friction as well uh, in the early days of the the late 1880s and the early 1890s. Uh, these are 1,500 head of, Ob of Aztec cattle at Obed Meadow. Uh, there was a, a large uh, uh, pond there that, of course, has now been dried up totally by the, uh, the, the water needs of the Choya power plant. But Obed Meadow used to be a very lush meadow, and these are all Aztec cattle at Obed Meadow, not far from Fort or Obed, by which by this time had been abandoned by the, the Mormon folk. Uh, these are 1,500 head of, of Aztec cattle being penned uh, at, Holt, at uh, Winslow. Uh, Winslow was the western headquarters of the Aztec Land and Cattle Company. Uh, and by this time, uh, Winslow was a pretty, going, pretty much a going place. Uh, the division, being the division point of the uh, railroad, uh, made it a very prosperous, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a large roundhouse at, um, at Winslow. And the, the founding father of Winslow was a fellow named Demarest, who was, the, who was a, a hotel man and in 1885 built the Arizona Central Hotel that you see on the right there. Uh, Frederick Clare Demarest was his name and he was really the founding father of Winslow. Uh, arrived there in 1882 and had a tent and by 1885 he'd put up a nice substantial two-story brick hotel. By 1885 Fort Apache was growing by leaps and bounds. They built a large hospital at Fort Apache in 1885 and the interesting thing about this photograph is that except for some of the rough lumber that was, that was uh, 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 cut on site, there was a small lumber mill down below the mesa uh, along the river. Everything else for this hospital had to be sh shipped in, freighted in uh, by railroad to Holbrook and then freighted across country uh, to Fort Apache. All the window sills, all the glass, all the instruments, all the beds, all the material, all the shingling, 
all of the, the material that made up this hospital had to be freighted in by railroad. And uh, many of the men in the, of the uh, White Mountains in the little Colorado country made their living, uh, made their living freighting for uh, Fort Apache. In 1885, the Buffalo Soldiers arrived at Fort Apache. Uh, this is a troop of the, of the 10th Cavalry. Uh, they arrived at Fort Apache in 1885 and stayed till 1892. Uh, these are the fellows that are credited with naming uh, a community we know as Pine Top. Uh, the fellows, the, there was a fellow named John Phipps, who was a former soldier from Fort Apache, started a, a little uh, farming operation up on the Pine Top Meadow, uh, using the waters, the headwaters of Sholo Creek, the Pine Top um, Springs, to uh, irrigate his land. Uh, fairly soon, he started uh, a little general store, and pretty soon that general store included a, a, a small saloon. And so these black troopers, when they're going on leave, they said, we're going to the top of the pines to see Old Pine Top. And Old Pine Top was a fellow named Walt Rigney, who was the bartender at uh, Johnny Phipps Saloon. And that's how uh, Pine Top eventually got its name. And, and, and we'll find, as we'll see, Pine Top was the third name for that community. Uh, there were two others uh, that began it a little earlier on. William Lewis Penrod, who uh, came to the Sholo country in 1878 as part of the Mormon colonization effort. He lived uh, down near Mr. Cooley for some time. He started a shingle mill down in the Sholo country and, uh, and sold some of his first shingles to Robert Scott, who had the large, uh, uh, the large sheep ranch about five miles away. His sons, uh, Leona and Leola, the, the twins, uh, became famous sheep shearers who would uh, for three dollars, for thirty-five cents a piece, they would shear sheep all day long, and at the end of the day, they'd have sheared a hundred sheep by hand with hand clippers, and they'd make three dollars and fifty cents, which they thought was a fortune in those days. Uh, the Penrods lived down in the Sholo country from 1878 to 1886. In the fall of 1886, uh, William Lewis Penrod and his son David Israel Penrod, uh, that we see here, uh, went looking for water, and they came up on the mountain and they found Johnny Phipps up uh, in the meadow. And they settled near him, and pretty soon uh, there were seven Penrod boys and five Penrod girls and the various assorted sons-in-law and daughters-in-law. And by the, by the winter of 1887, the new settlement was called Penrodville, uh, up in the White Mountains uh, at about 7,000 feet. In 1888, uh, just a year after we called the, the, that little community Penrodville, uh, sh uh, Holbrook had a tremendous uh, fire that burned down the entire town. And when they rebuilt it, uh, the A and B Schuster store was right side by side with the Arizona Cooperative Mercantile Institution. Uh, the ACMI had been shut out early on after the fracas between John Young and, and Mr. Holbrook. And, uh, but now uh, Adams and Burbage sold out their uh, rights in Holbrook to the ACMI. And so now the ACMI headquarters has moved up to Holbrook and it sits right side by side with the A&B Schuster store. And this is the new Holbrook um, Depot. It became a magnet uh, for freighting all over the White Mountains of the little Colorado country. It was built by a, a, one of the Owens who was a mason who had helped build the, uh, the Owens, the, uh, I can't remember his name at the moment. You, I'm sure that one of the Owens here can tell me what his name was, but he was a, a mason and helped build, had built the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. He also helped build the, the depot, the, tra the train depot in Holbrook. Uh, Mrs. Boyer built a brand new hotel in Holbrook right out after the fire. Uh, the upper, uh, with the Masonic Lodge in the upper level and the, was the headquarters of the Aztec Land and Cattle Company in the lower level. Uh, these are Aztec cowboys in the eight, late 1880s. They fell in the front row with the pipe is Pete Pemberton, who later became a, a constable in both Winslow and Holbrook. And the fellow in the middle of the back row was Rufus Cresswell, who became a supervisor for Apache County uh, in later years. But in these days, these are, these are the rough-looking, rather interesting-looking hash knife cowboys in front of their headquarters in Holbrook. In about this time frame, uh, Cordon Cooley, uh, who had brought in uh, Henry Huning as his partner in 1881, uh, finally had a falling out with Huning. Huning took over the ranch, and Cooley moved back on to the Fort Apache Indian Reservation, uh, make, take advantage of his wife's, uh, Molly is, is actually is just one wife by this time, Cora had passed away in 1893, uh, or yes. And so he's built this large two-story frame house uh, down below Honda, 
and it became one of the most uh, popular places in all the mountains. This was the stop on the first day out from Fort Apache and the last night in. And uh, uh, this is Cooley's family, his two sons, uh, Charles and Don, uh, and Molly is sitting with her back to us, unfortunately. This is on the porch of the Cooley home down at, uh, down at below Honda. Uh, these are troopers from Fort Apache. It became a major way station. Uh, there was a huge forage station here at, uh, at Cooley's Ranch, and uh, uh, they th it was one of the most popular places to stop in all the White Mountains for many, many years. And it's where our Cordon Cooley left after he left the Cholo country, went back down to the reservation. This young lady is Mayzetta Penrod. And she helps us uh, nail down the second name for what we came to know as Pine Top. Uh, in uh, the 4th of July of 1890, uh, Mayzetta Penrod was married to Nephi Packer in a place called Malpai City, Arizona. Uh, and just uh, a, a, month or, a month and a half earlier, John Phipps, who we know runs the bar and the uh, general store in Pine Top, what became known as Pine Top, uh, he got a, a, a franchise from the United States government to have a, a post office at Malpai. So now we could confirm it with Mayzetta's marriage because Mayzetta, who is the, one of the younger daughters of William Lewis Penrod, is not going to be married any place but near home. And we know it's Malpai City. Uh, that didn't last too long, however, because uh, the good Mormon folk in the area didn't like their, their uh, town uh, being in a saloon, so they uh, worked with the federal government and got Johnny Phipps uh, removed from being a postmaster. And so Malpai City went out, the Malpai Post Office went out of existence in August of 1890. And a year later, the Pine Top Post Office was established in E.E. E. Bradshaw's store in Pine Top. And of course, we know E.E. E. Bradshaw then went on to become the bishop of. Uh, the, the war down at Woodruff. Uh, so those are the three names that we have for our little town of Pine Top up in the White Mountains. I'm sure they're glad it's Pine Top and not Malpai or uh, uh, Penrodville. Uh, Malpai Lakeside doesn't sound as good as Pine Top Lakeside does today. In 1892, uh, Pine Top had its first convention. Uh, it was the uh, all-state conference of the Mormon Church. It was held in the Pines and in, in uh, people, about 1,100 people came from stakes all over Arizona, from down in the Salt River Valley and down in the Safford Valley and from St. John's and the Snowflake Stake. Uh, about 1,100 folks came to visit uh, uh, on the 4th of July weekend in the Pines of Pine Top in 1892. They built a huge dance pavilion uh, for, the, for the festivities, and uh, Jesse Smith and the, and the church elders who came down to Salt Lake City uh, cautioned the young Mormon folks that we did not want any round dancing. Uh, only square dancing. Uh, but after the church elders left, by golly, they broke out and did some round dancing anyway. Um, but they had something like 2,400 square feet of flooring put down for the dance floor at the pavilion in Pine Top for the state conference in 1892. This is another vi view of it, uh, some of the tents for folks who were tending out in the pines, the nice cool pines. Uh, sort of an early, an early vision of what uh, tourism would be like in the White Mountains uh, started back in 1892. Uh, over, uh, not far from Pine Top was a little town called Fairview, uh, and it had the unfortunate name of, called, was called Hogtown, uh, uh, because there were a lot of hogs running wild in the forest. Uh, the Van Cleves had a lot of hogs up there, and the Youngs, Al Young had a lot of hogs. Uh, but Jesse Smith didn't like that. Jesse Smith was the president of the local, of the stake, so he got together with the local folks and they changed the name to Woodland. And in 1892, Woodland got its first school in November of 1892. So Woodland is part of the Pine Top Lakeside history and it gets started with a, a nice Mormon colony. Uh, also some, some of the, the Spaniards, some of the Spanish shepherds that worked for the Amos brothers uh, also went to school at Woodland. Uh, and it was a very nice little community out in the forest uh, about five miles um, from Pine Top. This is the Gus Hansen's homestead, which was part of the Woodland Settlement. That's a current day photograph, but it gives you some idea of the large meadows out in the Woodland, which, in what would become Woodland. Uh, sheep were still very important in the 1880s. I mentioned the Penrod brothers uh, were, uh, became famous sheep shearers. They worked for a fellow named Will Amos. In 1893, uh, Niels Hansen built a large adobe home uh, right at the edge of the, of the creek. Uh, and it uh, uh, 
was the home of Will Amos, who was one of the three Amos brothers. There were the Amos brothers, the Scott brothers. There was a fellow named William Porter, uh, who was the surveyor for Apache County, and Porter Mountain is named after him. He had a large sheep operation between Lakeside and Sholo. William Morgan was another large sheep man in the area. Uh, he always called Sholo home. Uh, he helped to uh, write the Arizona Constitu Convention in 1910. He was a member of the Constitutional Convention. But there were a lot of sheep men in the, in the, between Sholo and Lakeside, and they really kept people uh, employed uh, in the various opera sheep operations. Uh, but this went on in, in the early days from the, er the 1890s to about 19. 04-05. But in the 1890s, things got real tough up on the mountain. Uh, there was a major drought that fastened itself on the whole southwest from Los Angeles to Nebraska. And Arizona was not uh, immune to it. And things got started to dry up pretty, pretty much in the 1890s. By 1902 and 1904, Adair Spring was the only spring running in the White Mountains. All the rest had dried up. And the sheep men began to move out. But their day was in the late 1890s and the early 1900s was the heyday of sheep in the Sholo uh, Pine Top Lakeside area. Uh, wool was an important crop uh, from these sheep, and this is a, a large uh, load of wool being developed, de delivered to uh, Holbrook. Notice they're using oxen, which is rather unusual for, the, for that time period. Uh, there was a fellow named Sylvester McCoy, who was, became the merchant in Pine Top after Johnny Phipps. Uh, McCoy was one of the few men who used oxen, so this might be Sylvester McCoy's ox team delivering wool in Holbrook at this late 1890s. Uh, and again, uh, uh, Holbrook was a major shipping point for, for wool and for cattle. Uh, it was the, the major point that those, the, the pens and the, the depot in Holbrook, uh, a lot of freight went in and out of that depot, a lot of cattle were shipped and brought in at Holbrook and a lot of sheep and a lot of wool went out of, the, of those yards. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the men in the Silver Creek Valley and up in Sholo and Pine Top Lakeside made their living freighting. Uh, this is an army ambulance uh, that was the fastest way to get for between uh, Holbrook and Fort Apache it was with the six mules. Uh, this is a very common sight on the road between uh, Holbrook and Sholo and White Mountains and down to White River and Fort Apache. Uh, when Mormon farmers were not using their wagons to, to uh, harvest crops, they were uh, taking uh, subcontracts to freight between Holbrook. Uh, you read the paper, the Holbrook Argus from the late 1890s and the early 1900s, and there are always freight teams on the road from men in Snowflake and Taylor and Sholo and Pine Top and Woodland. Uh, when they weren't uh, doing other things, they were freighting between Holbrook and Fort Apache. Here are huge loads of alfalfa going down for the horses, at, for, the, for the cavalry mounts at Fort Apache. Uh, these men are taking a noon break for, for dinner. Uh, but these are all uh, big loads of alfalfa from the Silver Creek Valley going down to Fort Apache. Uh, even the mail coach was a big deal. Uh, oftentimes, the mail coach would come from Holbrook, would stop at the, at the Reed Head house in Sholo. Uh, there was a special room in the back of the house where they would uh, lock the, the, the lieutenant that had the, the pay uh, they would lock him in that room all night to keep, from, for, keep the pay from being stolen. And the next morning, they'd load up the wagons and the, and the, the, uh, the ambulance and, and take, the, take the, uh, the pay down on into Fort Apache because it was all gold and silver and a few greenbacks in those days. Uh, down in the Silver Creek Valley, things were getting a little prosperous in the 1890s. Uh, this is the uh, Aquila Stanford, Stanford House in uh, Taylor. Uh, it was built for one of the Brimhall families in eight, about 1890 built by the Willis Brothers of Snowflake. Uh, so again, Taylor is finally beginning to have some of the prosperity that had come to uh, Snowflake about a decade earlier now uh, is beginning to show itself in Taylor in the 1890s. Uh, this is the home of um, James Madison Flake that was built in 1895. That's a rather uh, a grand uh, Victorian home, uh, again indicating the prosperity of the Snowflake Valley. Uh, that went on in the 1890s. A lot of these homes are still in existence and makes a snowflake a wonderful jewel. People interested in architectural history, all the wonderful uh, brick Victorian and folk uh, homes of the 1880s and 1890s still exist in the down in Snowflake. Uh, the Willis brothers who built those homes in Taylor also had a large general merchandise company in Snowflake and, and also took a lot of the contracts. A lot of people freighted uh, on subcontracts from the Willis brothers uh, who bid on a lot of the contracts that 
hauling freight out of Fort Apache and down to Fort Apache. Uh, so we've come to the end of this. And we'll just keep on going here because we have a few more to, to, uh, to show. This is the Flake Brothers, who are also major uh, dealers in general merchandise down in, in the Snowflake Valley, and also had a lot of contracts between Fort Apache. A lot of the men worked for the Flake Brothers as well. By 1898, uh, the, the Spanish-American War was going on, and our friends uh, uh, had a large, uh, uh, a large encampment. A lot of the cavalry units didn't have room to uh, to be in the regular parade grounds at Fort Apache, so they built some encampments up near, um, up near the, the stables at Fort Apache. There was a lot of activity going on at Fort Apache during the Spanish-American War, and a lot of freighting back and forth, a lot of cavalry units in and out. Uh, the 9th Cavalry, the, the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, and additional troops were, were operating out of Fort Apache in 1898. Uh, up in Pine Top, the Penrod brothers built a dance hall. It's not there anymore. It's now Lois Penrod's ground dancer, but in 1898 they built a large 25 by 50 foot dance hall with a big cook stove in the back, a big heating stove that would take four foot lengths of, of uh, cordwood. Uh, it was huge, but it helped warm that dance hall. And the dance hall was a very popular spot for dances all over the mountain. In fact, on the uh, New Year's Eve of 1899, uh, people came from all over the country to have a, a special dance at the, at the Penrod Brothers Dance Hall to welcome in the new century. Uh, the Post Band came up from Fort Apache to play, and they danced all night. Folks from Snowflake and Taylor and Woodland and Sholo uh, came to dance at the Penrod Brothers Dance Hall in 1899. Uh, the Mormon Church developed uh, secondary education in the uh, whole region in the 1890s. Uh, this is the brand new uh, Snowflake Steak Academy uh, that was built between 1898 and 1899. It was a tremendous boon for Snowflake, but for the whole stake. Uh, secondary education was now a reality. Uh, showed the importance of education to the Mormon culture uh, with the Snowflake Stake Academy and the St. John Stake Academy that was built in 1899 and 1900. Uh, both of these buildings uh, were in operation until about 1921 when the Mormon church went out of the secondary, secondary school business and uh, local high schools took over. But for those years, from, from about 1900 to 1921, uh, the Snowflake Stake Academy and the St. John Stake Academy were the, the major high schools in the whole White Mountain Little Colorado region. In 1900, the little town of Shumway built its brick schoolhouse. Uh, it's one of the real gems left in this whole country. Uh, it's probably one of the very, very few one-room brick schoolhouses. It was built in 1900 down in Shumway. In 1902, the ACMI built a brand new building down in Springerville. Uh, the ACMI was prospering at the turn of the century, and they ordered this brand new uh, cast iron front for Mesker Brothers in St. Louis and built a great big adobe, two-story adobe um, ACMI building that was run by a fellow named uh, uh, William Francis Lesueur. Uh He also had a wonderful house up in Eager that is still there today uh, that is called Paisley Corners. It's a bed and breakfast. Uh, but that was also the place where many babies were born in Round Valley. Um, uh, Mr. LeSueur's wife was a midwife. She was actually a, a registered nurse. But in those days in Arizona, you had to be registered as a midwife. A re an RN wasn't as important as a midwife. So she, she, she went from an RN to become a midwife and delivered many of the babies from the whole White Mountains and Round Valley area there at her home in Eager. Up in uh, the Sholo country, a little, little community called Adair that's now underneath uh, Full Hollow Reservoir that you see here. Adair got its first post office in 1899. Uh, a fellow named Jesse Brady was the first postmaster, and the Little Mormon community of Adair had its own post office uh, and from 1899 to 1906 when mail was forwarded to Sholo. Uh, but all that's left of Adair, of course, being underwater is the Adair Cemetery, where many of the local community, the, the Eds, the Whipples, and the McNeils, and the Ellsworths are all buried at the Adair Cemetery. Uh, in 1903, as I mentioned, the, uh, the sheepmen were getting out of the country. The, the, the drought was in full force. Uh, it was very difficult to move sheep from the Salt River Valley up to winter in the, in the Sholo country. Uh, the sheepmen started getting out of the business. Uh, the Amos is sold out to Niels Hansen. And down in Sholo, uh, 
Mr. Flake came in once again and bought out uh, Henry Huning's interest and uh, uh, the White House that was the old Cooley House up on the hill became the first bishop's home of the new community of Sholo. But they needed water very badly. Water was in short supply. It was really tough. So they went back up on the mountain uh, with, with Wrencher and Hanson and they found a, the, the survey site that had been, had been laid out by Brigham Young Jr. many years before. And uh, they built the, the dam and, and, and formed Rainbow Lake, which was uh, to provide water for the new irrigation company that was to serve the new farming operations on the old Huning Ranch in Sholo uh, for the Mormon settlers that were going to move into the area, take up the, the old Huning Ranch and farm and uh, develop this community. Rainbow Lake was developed because of the need for water during this very bad drought period of the early, 19th, of the early 20th century. Uh, Niels Hansen, who had built the home for uh, William Amos in 1893, now in 1905, moves back into the home that he had built for another man, and it, it becomes his home. And in 1906, uh, Hansen and several of his brethren, including Joseph Peterson, who was the, the principal of the Snowflake Stake Academy, got together and named the community Lakeside. Uh, and so Lakeside, because it's this, this house was right next to the, the new Rainbow Reservoir, the new Rainbow Lake, they named it, Res they named it Lakeside. In 1904, the ACMI moved to Sholo. Uh, in 1904-1905, this building was built at the corner of Huning and 11th. In 1904, uh, a woman named Douge Phelps uh, married a fellow named Fred Coulter. Uh, Douge Phelps was the daughter of Micah J. Harris Phelps and inherited the, the, the Crossbar Ranch. Uh, Fred was the straw boss for the, comp for the ranch. Uh, he married Douge and took over and built it into a huge 20th century cattle operation down in, in uh, in Round Valley and in, in Apache County. Uh, most of the big old cattle outfits like the Aztec and the 24 and the, and the Long H were gone and Fred Colder took over, built a 16,000 acre ranch, 7,500 acres of agricultural land, had 12,000 head of cattle by 1906, brought in purebred Hereford bulls and there was open range and uh, put them out on the range to improve the herd. Uh, they were there for, every, for any cow but uh, f there was no, no fences, so they just went out across the whole range. But uh, Fred Coulter made a huge operation up there. The Crossbar Ranch was, in the early 20th century, was one of the major uh, cattle operations in all of uh, Navajo and Apache counties. 1908, the uh, 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 bank was established in, uh, uh, the first bank was established in Snowflake, again showing the prosperity of the country, uh, that a bank can, can make a go in a small farming community in, the, in 1908. Up on the mountain, Eve Penrod opened a, a general store in Pine Top, and uh, his wife, Mary Jane, who was a Hanson, uh, became the postmistress. And uh, this was, uh, uh, these small mercantile stores in the mountains were, I guess, very similar to today's Circle K's. Uh, they had all the, the, the uh, stuff that you needed that, uh, immediately. Uh, if you went, you did your major shopping, you went to Holbrook or over to Winslow or uh, one of the big towns, but uh, most of your small shopping was done in the small communities at a place like this, which was Eve Penrod's general store. Over in Holbrook, uh, the J&J &J Trading Company is a good example of the trading posts that were going up uh, to service the growing uh, Navajo trade in the, in the border towns along the reservation border. Uh, this is still exists in, in Holbrook today. It's a large trading post to, to service the Navajo trade to, to deal in mutton and uh, Navajo rugs and sheep and, and uh, pelts and, and wool. Uh, large trading operations were growing up along the, uh, along the little Colorado there in Holbrook and Winslow. This is the home of uh, Sidney Sapp, who was the uh, local publisher in, in, uh, in Holbrook, again showing the, uh, the development of housing in the area, the, the prosperity of the area. Uh, the Anglo culture that's uh, growing up in these areas is doing very well during this time frame. Up in St. John's, uh, David King Udall, who was the, uh, the bishop of the local Mormon church there, built his long dreamed of California bungalow uh, in 1912. Uh, of course, David King Udall is the grandfather of uh, Stuart Udall and Morris Udall, well-known Arizona politicians. Uh, this, of course, hotel is still in existence today. It's now the Elm Hotel in St. John's. Uh, Udall, uh, for many years, had, uh, with his brother Joseph, had run the, the Round Valley Mill, the one that had been started by Milligan. Uh, had been owned by the Udall brothers for many years. Uh, David King Udall ran that mill, and then later on when he was in St. John's, he helped run the, the big grist mill up in St. John's. Uh, he also was part of the power company and did many things in his long career, long and storied career up in the St. John's area. 
1912 over in Winslow, things are getting pretty modern now. You build the new Elks Club building. It's a large building right in the corner. And uh, it had a drugstore down below. If any of your, uh, if you ever heard your grandchildren talk about the Eagles, uh, their, their song, Take It Easy, standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona, this is the corner they're talking about. Uh, it's a later, later uh, musical interlude. Uh, but in 1912, this was the Elks Club, uh, showing you a real difference between the communities up on the mountain and the, the communities along the river uh, down below in Winslow and Holbrook. Uh, they're growing m much more into city-like uh, communities uh, rather early on in the 20th century. Up in, <clears throat> up in Lakeside, the West Hotel uh, goes into operation in 1915. And now even in the small communities up in the mountains, uh, there's a need for a hotel, if nothing more for traveling salesmen uh, and for uh, people going through. More and more people are starting to be on the move. And the West Hotel opens in, in uh, Lakeside in 1915. Uh, Cordon Cooley passed away in 1917, and uh, they had a full military uh, burial at, uh, at Fort Apache. This is the, again, the black troops from the 9th Cavalry were on hand, and in their dress uniforms had a 21-gun salute during Cooley's burial at Fort Apache. The Presbyterian Church over in uh, Springerville had been there from about, eight, from about 1891 on, uh, but built a brand new uh, church in 1891, again, showing the prosperity of the, of the culture that's uh, going on uh, in, those, in that time frame the 19, during World War I, 1918. Up in St. John's, the Apache County Courthouse, brand new courthouse made of sandstone, goes up in 1918, as did something called the New Dawn Hotel from the same, same sandstone quarry. Uh, St. John's is prospering as well as the county seat for Apache County is doing very well, uh, and things are going along quite well in, in, in Apache County. When the Mormon Church went out of the secondary school business, uh, the St. John's Stake Academy went out of business, and they built the new, brand new St. John's High School, uh, again out of the same sandstone as the, the courthouse and the, um, and the New Dawn Hotel, uh, again in 1922. In 1921, there was a huge strike against the Santa Fe Railroad in Winslow, very bitter strike. They built a, a huge fence around the entire property and kept everybody out. Uh, it was at that time that they imported a large number of native people, a lot of Laguna Indians, came from the Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico to work for the Santa Fe and the Roundhouse, and they built a, a whole community of, uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the Lagunas uh, out of boxcars, and they put their, brought in their traditional ovens. Uh, but again, the native peoples were coming into the area, and again, just to work for the Santa Fe Railroad, but still it's a very important part of, of what goes on here in the, in the 1920s. Uh, St. Joseph's Catholic Church was built in 1923 over in, uh, over in, in Winslow. Uh, the Catholic Church, all the churches in the White Mountains and the little Colorado country are all part of the Gallup of Dias, the, the Diocese of Gallup. Uh, they were in 1900, they were in 1923, they still are today. Uh, St. Joseph's is one of those and it's still there today and a very nice uh, uh, example of the architecture of Winslow. In 1923, a fellow named Richard Bruckman uh, again opens a curio business. This is a little different than a trading post. This is now a curio business selling Indian goods to tourists. The automobile is starting to, to make a, a real inroads. Uh, you're starting to see more and more automobile traffic going across the country. And to take advantage of this, you, they, and they didn't open a trading post or a general merchant's dice store. It is a, an Indian curio store in Winslow in 1923. In 1922, uh, Fort Apache's decommissioned as a military post. Uh, all the troops were sent down to Fort Huachuca. All that was left until 1943 was a, was a company of uh, Apache scouts that you see here. Um, but what's going to happen now? Fort Apache was a huge part of the economy of the White Mountains and Little Colorado country. What's going to take its place? We've talked about this a lot. All the things that went on that, that brought income into the, into the region. Uh, what took its place was the Apache Railroad and the new community of Cooley up on the mountains. A big lumber mill was built by Thomas Pollock, a famous um, uh, lumberman from Flagstaff, builds the, uh, builds the large uh, mill there. Uh, the, the Apache Railroad is finished in 1918. Unfortunately, the depression after the World War I, the deflation of prices, uh, put Pollock out of business. And in comes Mr. Cady 
and Mr. McNary from Louisiana. They formed the Katie Lumber Company, renamed Cooley McNary, uh, and imported a large community of black citizens from McNary, Louisiana, uh, and the large black population, the first black population really in the whole country was brought in uh, to live in McNary. These are the Brooks brothers, Johnny Brooks and his brother, who had come in from Louisiana, uh, lived, uh, lived in what was called the Quarters. Uh, there was segregated housing in Holbrook, excuse me, not Holbrook, in, in McNary. Uh, segregated housing for the, there was, a, there was a black community, there was a, a barrio for the Spanish-speaking people, and there was an Indian community. It was a very segregated town, uh, but it was a very prosperous place, and it did a lot for the, for the community, for the whole region. Uh, these are the Navajo brush cutters who are cleaning up the forest after they've been lumbering. Uh, they, came behind the, they, they came behind the logging operation and cleaned up the forest at the insistence of the Forest Service. And uh, not only Navajo brush cutters, but also Apaches. They lived in small villages like this right at the outskirts of McNary. Uh, but it was a beautiful little town. The St. Anthony's Church uh, was brought in during the Pollock era. And uh, again, the, there was a large Spanish population in, in McNary. Uh, they took advantage with, the, with St. Anthony's Church. There was also a non-denominational church that was started by the Presbyterian Church of um, Springerville, but it quickly became non-denominational. It's called the Chapel in the Pines. Also a hotel for unmarried men working in the mill, the Apache Hotel. Uh, so all of a sudden you have this huge settlement, large settlement up there on the mountain. Uh, that uh, brings in a lot of money for the whole region. Uh, the McNary Movie Theater, uh, which was a great movie theater except when it was raining because that's a Quonset hut in the back and it was metal. And when the rain was, when it was raining on metal, it was very hard to hear the soundtrack uh, in the movie theater. But it was a very popular spot. It was one of the first uh, movie theaters uh, on the mountain. And of course, the McNary General Store. Uh, when you talk to people down in the, uh, talk to other flatlanders down in the Salt River Valley, and you talk about the White Mountains, a little Colorado country, there are two things they always talk about. The McNary General Store and Charlie Clark's Restaurant. Um, but the, the General Store was one of the very popular spots uh, for many, many years. Uh, they sold everything from ten penny nails to fur coats in the McNary General Store. Uh, it was quite a place and uh, uh, was one of the nicest stores in the whole region. But this is the thing that really drove the economy after Fort Apache was gone. This is part of 22 million board feet of Arizona white pine in the yards at McNary. Uh, this is what really helped the economy thrive uh, during that period of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, McNary also, the, the Apache Railroad also took out a lot of cattle out of this country. Um, the railroad ran from Holbrook up to McNary, and then spur lines ran out to Standard and up to Maverick. Um, but uh, the Apaches became great cattlemen in the, in the 1950s, and the cattle auction of, in the fall up at McNary was, brought cattle buyers from all, of, all over the southwest to buy cattle at McNary and to be shipped out uh, to California and to Kansas. Uh, but that was a good, big part of their business was cattle shipping on the Apache Railroad. In about 1926, Lorenzo Lizenby came up from the Salt River Valley and built the Busy Bee uh, grocery store up in Lakeside. Uh, the interesting thing about it was that he was there for about two years, and then he sold out to a fellow named T.A. Caldwell. Uh, but one of the first things they did was they built some little cabins, little slab-sided huts in the back. But tourists were, were starting to come to the valley, fishermen, hunters. And so they, these are the first tourist cabins on the mountain. It was up there at Caldwell's, um, uh, behind the Busy Bee store in Lakeside. And Lakeside decided we are going to capitalize on some of this uh, some of that wonderful uh, tourism we started in 1892 and in 1928 they started the June Moon Water Festival at Rainbow Lake. Uh, they advertised it, in the, this was an advertisement in the Arizona Gazette down in Phoenix, uh, but it was 1928, it was almost impossible to get up here by road. And you had to go to, you had to go to Ash Fork and then along over to Holbrook and then down Silver Creek. There was no real way to get up here, so not many people came from the Salt River Valley, but a lot of people came from the White Mountains and they had a great time. Uh, the Apaches came up and, and had the gone dance, and uh, they had a barbecue and a rodeo, and they had uh, rest, uh, boxing matches. They'd, they'd put cars on four sides of a square and turn the lights on and have nighttime boxing matches and dances and all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, but uh, again, this is the, just the beginning of the interest in tourism starting in the late 1920s up on the mountain. La Posada, the last of the great Fred Harvey hotels, was built in 1930 in Winslow. 
Again, this is the heyday of tourists on the trains, and uh, the La Posada was the last one built. The de Depression really spoiled its, uh, its beginning, and uh, uh, it did not develop the traffic that uh, they'd expected because, of course, automobiles are really coming into their own. Uh, you're seeing the development of auto courts now, uh, ones like this down in Winslow, uh, excuse me, down in Holbrook, where uh, people would come and, and stay and, and, uh, uh, and have their automobiles. Notice that, notice that the, right beside the cabin is, the, is, a, is a garage, basically, for your car. Uh, very cozy uh, uh, little auto court, uh, but this was the, the coming trend uh, was the automobile, automobile traffic. Uh, Campbell's Coffee House in Holbrook, and notice the Santa Fe Trail stage lines, bringing tourists into the area uh, with now big, large buses are starting to come in the, in the late 20s and early 30s. Uh, large signs like this on the side of Brookman's store in Winslow, a large map of the whole region, uh, became very popular in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. When they took it off recently, there was such a hue and cry from tourists who wanted to see the map that they'd seen all their lives that they had to put it back on the building uh, over, over in Winslow. Uh, but this was showed you that the automobiles had, be, had come into their own, that you now have these large maps showing ways to get around by car. Up on the mountain, uh, Thel Penrod, one of William Lewis's uh, uh, grandsons, again, uh, started the Blue Ridge uh, cabins in 1934. Uh, very small operation, and it's still an operation today. But again, it started in, in, the, in the early 1930s. Lake of the Woods was started by a fellow named Floyd Mockler in 1936. It was just a, an auto court. And it, over the years, developed into a very uh, nice uh, resort in the, in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, Charlie Clark's 1938, up in, up in Pine Top. Uh, as I say, people remember two things about this country, the McNary General Store and Charlie Clark's. Charlie was really a rancher. Uh, but he's, he lived, was ranching over near Concho, but his wife died and he, the, the place uh, lost its interest for him. And he came over and opened a restaurant here in old Jake Renfro's Log Cabin Inn that became in 1938 Charlie Clark's. This is Charlie himself. Everybody, everybody knows about the restaurant, but not many people have seen a picture of Charlie. Uh, the first Lakeside Homeowners Association is part of the very first summer cabins built on Forest Service land in the White Mountains. Uh, this, is the, this was built in 1938 up in Lakeside. Uh, again, it was on leased land from the Forest Service. It was an experiment, started in 1938. And of course, in 1958, they did up in the White Mountains, and us Flatlanders have been coming up and bothering you people ever since. 1939, uh, they built the WPA project. They built a large hospital over in, uh, over in Springerville. Uh, Bert Coulter, who was one of Fred's brothers, uh, was the county supervisor, got some good WPA money, and they built the, built the uh, uh, White Mountain Hospital in Springerville. Uh, during the late Depression years, they built a beautiful new ward chapel down in Snowflake. Uh, it burned right away, and they finished it during World War II, of all things. Uh, but it, again, it shows the, the strength of the culture. Uh, the dominant Mormon culture and the Anglo culture in this region was very strong, and the faith was very strong, and they built this building during the Depression years and then rebuilt it in, in during the World War II, and it was hard to get materials. Uh, but it's a good example of, of the, the strength of the religion and the culture in the, in the region. And then in the 1950s, uh, the Lakeside Chapel was finished, uh, started during the war years, and finally, finally finished in the early 1950s. Again, the culture is very strong. Uh, over in Sholo, the, the new, brand new ward chapel was in the early 1950s. Uh, so the Mormon, the Mormon culture, the Anglo culture is very strong uh, in the White Mountains in those days. But so was the Spanish culture, and the, the missions were very strong over in uh, the San Juan Mission in St. John's was, was doing very well at this time. The San Rafael Mission over in Concho, and the San Pedro Mission in Springerville. Uh, on those feast days of these folks, all the Spanish people would come and visit one another. They would, they would go when there was a Span feast day in St. John's. Everyone would go to St. John's when the, Span the feast day occurred in uh, Concho or <clears throat> down in Springerville. All the Spanish folks would come in for fiesta and, and visit together. Uh, so their culture were very strong. And of course, the sunrise dance was still danced in Fort Apache. Uh, the, the puberty ceremony of young Apache girls was still going very strong. And the Don still came out from Mount Baldy and danced for the puberty ceremony. So all the cultures were still here. 
They had started in 1870. They came together in the 1870s. 100 years later, they were still here, sometimes living side by side in concert, sometime in discord, but they all abided together in the beautiful White Mountains, little Colorado country. Uh, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for your attention. Hope you enjoyed the program.